Um, yeah, good morning. Welcome to the second and the last lecture on moonshine. And uh, so let's start with a little recap on what we have seen yesterday. And uh, after that, I think there will be a natural point uh, where we can ask more questions if th that's necessary. And after that, we'll hike straight into the land of moonshine. So first recall, we said roughly what moonshine is. Well, we have two types of mathematical structures. One goes under the name modular objects, and we have seen uh, the most uh, uh, you know, well-known examples of this, which is the modular function yesterday. And then we talked about some fun facts about finite groups that are relevant for the story. And roughly speaking, moonshine refers to the connection between the two. The, well, unexpected is not well-defined um, mathematical term, but if it's too obvious, and people tend not to call it moonshine. And then the hope is to find some physical theory here, which will solve the moonshine problem, a particular moonshine problem, by giving the moonshine relation some, you know, meaning and explanation. And typically, how it's related to modular objects is through the computation of some physical quantities, for instance, partition function. And the finite groups then plays a role, typically as uh, appropriately defined symmetry group of your physical theory. So that's sort of a very vague definition of moonshine. And then we talked about examples of modular objects. And the simplest example is what's called the J function. And it is invariant under the SO2Z transformation. acting on the upper half plane in the natural way. And further, it has the property that as tau goes to I infinity, OK, the low temperature limit if you're doing partition function, then uh, it starts with q to the minus 1. And the second term is 0. and you have higher powers of Q following that. And it turns out that these two conditions, these two conditions specify the J function uniquely. And the key reason why this is true is that the fundamental domain on the upper half plane of SO2Z is a circle up to a few points that you have to glue in. And this J function then provides an isomorphism between the two circles. And we know that once you specify three points on the circle, this is fixed. So uh, this is why J function, uh, the, the J function is unique. Another interesting fact that we mentioned about this function is that when we write out the other terms, we see that the number look suspiciously interesting in its connection to the largest sporadic group, the monster group. To be more precise, and then in general, we call this coefficient, n's coefficient cn. To be more precise, well, this one 
is the dimension of V1, the trivial representation, the smallest representation of the monster, and this is V1. You add in uh, the first, the smallest non-trivial representation of the monster group, which has dimension 196AA3, and so on. And as some of you asked me, I think privately yesterday, this pattern, of course, has to break because there is just 194 irreducible representations. This v, v small v runs only to V194 for the monster group. But the point is, even though, you know, it's not just like 1 plus 2 plus 3 and so on, you can still find a uh, representation, not necessarily this sort of uh, combination of e wraps, but some wrap such that the dimension coincides with Cn for some large n. Okay, so that's a hint of moonshine. And then we talked about something about 2D CFT in the orbifold context. Okay, well, so we explained very briefly why we expect a partition function. So today I'm going to be uh, more schematic and I'm going to focus only on the holomorphic part. So there's tau, I will skip writing down tau bar and q bar. So roughly speaking, on the holomorphic side, this is the holomorphic partition function. And we expect it also to be related to um, the torus. Uh, this is, uh, well, from the path integral uh, from, the, from the path integral uh, intuition, we expect it to be given by something like this. Of course, strictly speaking, because we're, do, we're working with holomorphic CFT, so um, this is uh, only serves as an intuition, but there is more, uh, you know, rigorous way to argue for uh, moduli invariance. Uh, but for the purpose uh, of ours, this is enough of an argument, at least suggesting uh, why this is true that uh, the partition function is invariant under SO2Z. Well, simply because SO2Z leaves a torus invariant. Okay, so that's um, the modular invariance of a partition function of a conformal field theory. Now, let's focus on the case where the theory admits a finite group symmetry. That means that the Hilbert space is a representation of a certain finite group G. Moreover, this group G commutes with the Verisor algebra and hence each subcomponent, okay, graded by N, denotes the, um, the eigenvalue of L0 minus C over 24 is a representation of the finite group G. Then you can have finer information than your partition function. Namely, the partition function simply uh, computes the dimension of uh, these uh, Hilbert spaces. But um, if you have a group action, you can also compute how the group acts on the representation in terms of uh, the characters, the group characters. So, in our notation yesterday, we'll draw a box diagram like this. This is computed as this. Uh, okay. So you insert a G action in the trace, okay, where G is 
an element of the symmetry group of your theory. So this is, of course, the same as indeed the group character graded by uh, the L0 eigenvalues. Okay. But how about the SO2Z action? You see here, because you have a decorated torus with a different boundary condition on the time circle, on the temporal circle, along the temporal circle and the, time and the spatial circle, so this is not SO2Z invariant. In particular, you expect the S transformation to be given by, you know, just exchanging uh, the two boundary conditions because the action of S transformation on the torus is exchanging the A and B cycle. And uh, I'll use the notation of equa equa uh, this equality sign on a bracket as um, this is this means equality up to a phase. Okay. And uh, in the notes that uh, I'll eventually write for Tassi, I'll get the, all the phases um, in details. But for now, we don't want to spend the whole lecture on phases. So here is the notation to get away with that. Okay, and in general, more generally, you can just uh, straightforwardly generalize this transformation property I have to write mega big because these boxes have a lot of decorations on it. H B C H D C tau plus D A tau plus B. Oh, talking about lecture notes. Um, so um, there are some set of lecture notes linked. Uh, on the wiki page, and uh, it's the lecture notes for uh, the winter school from last year, which, so which is a little different from what I'm teaching now, but 70% the same, so it might still be uh, useful to look at them. Okay, so this is the decorated version of um, of SO2Z transformation when your theory has a finite group symmetry. In particular, if you take both G and H as an identity element, then, of course, you recover the SO2Z invariance of the usual partition function. And uh, before we stopped yesterday, we also gave um, an example of this. Namely, we take a theory such that the original theory has as target space the 24 dimensional torus defined by the leech lattice, the unique self dual even um, positive definite lattice in 24 dimensions that have no root. Okay, so no shortest, uh, shortest length uh, root, uh, lattice vector. And then we take a very simple orbifold, which is Z2 generated uh, by G, an order two element, which acts by inverting all uh, the direct, uh, inverting all directions. And then we computed this uh, theory, this, this, the, the partition function of the orbifold theory and yesterday the notation is that we call that the partition function of the FLM model because it's constructed initially by Franco, Lebowski, and Merman. And 
An orbifold theory partition function is obtained by combining all twisted sectors and all possible twinings to ensure the G invariance of the fina final Hilbert space. Okay? And now we have computed this on board. If you didn't take notes, it's, I noticed that it's also in the notes of she's, she ins, um, of she's lectures. And you arrive at nothing else but the J function. Okay, so that's what we talked about yesterday. Um, and in what follows, I will first tell you how to tie these elements together into a story that's called Monstrous Moonshine. And then we will talk about other moonshines that ha that's been happening more recently. But before that, if there's questions, So, yeah, the recap is all crystal clear. That's fantastic. So, okay. So yesterday, we say that there could be, you know, you might want to conjecture that um, Okay, I run out of uh, space, so let me kill this board. So yesterday we saw that uh, from looking at from looking at uh, the coefficients of the J function and its relation to the irreducible representations of the monster group, you might want to conjecture that there exists an infinite dimensional representation. Well, because you have an infinite series, right? So you need infinitely many turns terms and then an infinite dimensional representation such that this is true infinitely many times. And we again need the Z grading corresponding to different powers of Q such that in each term it is finite dimensional, the representation. Uh, that's uh, the natural symbol. Yeah, um, I didn't invent this. Uh, <laughs> FLN invented this. Yeah, because, um, well, what's the reason? Because people are looking for representations of um, the monster group, such a weird gr sporadic group. Uh, representation just means something that the group can act on, right? Because there's no lattice, there's no like, and it's sporadic, you know, it's not in one of the families, so it's kind of like weird. Uh, but uh, hopefully because J is, J function is such a natural thing because of uniqueness and because of its, you know, all other importance in mathematics, so you think like this representation m must be natural, so let's put a natural sign in it. I guess that's sort of the sociology behind the notation. Okay, so we might want to conjecture that there exists such a, a representation for each um, integer larger than minus one such that this is true. And in particular, it looks like when n is minus one, then this is just, uh, you know, the trivial representation that one is positive one and it's this combination and so on because that looks natural. But we also say that it's kind of silly because you know you can take as many uh, trivials as you want. But um, what we can do is if such a representation actually exists, there's not just the dimension you can compute. 
there's the graded characters also, right? Just like in the Orbifold case, you can, you know, see how the group acts on. So consider, how about this guy? So we replace that. So this is yet another infinite Q series we can consider. And the conjecture says that uh, such that, you know, this is the situation for the identity element. Moreover, all this other infinite Q series are just are also very, very special infinite Q series. Okay. For all, let's do that for all group elements, you have a help module. Um, so what does that mean? Let me just say, let me just explain the words. So it means that TG uh, tau is again the unique such function such that okay so first of all this subgroup of SO2R has to have the property that it defines a uh, genus zero quotient on the upper half plane, just like SO2Z. So it's no longer the keyhole, it has some funny shapes, but um, when you compatify it, it's again a sphere. And once you accept that, again we have the same argument that once you fix these terms, this behavior at the cost at i infinity, you're done. This is unique. Okay. And we know that this has to be true because we know that the leading term is a trivial representation, so this is the same for all g. And the second term has no dimension, so this is zero. So that's, then you're done. And uh, this has to be true for all elements, but fortunately we don't have to check like 10 to the 54 because the trace is of course invariant under conjugation, so you just have to check through 194 uh, conjugacy classes. With sufficient willpower or sufficient number of grad students, you can do that. Um, so this is the conjecture, uh, the, co the so-called monstrous moonshine conjecture that was posed in the year 79. And by now, of course, it's a theorem. Monstrous Moonshine Theorem. Okay. So how do you prove that? What? Um, okay. Well, First, you assume that the representation exists. Then, you define uh, the function as the character, graded character of uh, the representation. And then, you conjecture that this natural representation has the property such that this is a modular form. This Q series, infinite Q series, is again, like the J function, a modular form. But not 
any more module form for SO2Z, but some other module form for, you know, for uh, some other um, discrete subgroups uh, that acts on the upper half plane. Moreover, this has to define a uh, genus zero quotient on the upper half plane. And moreover, this function is a unique function that induces this isomorphism. So I hope this is clear about what the assumption is and what the requirement is. Will it help if I give an example of such a group? Well, so for instance, for one G, for certain G, I think it's called 2A or 2B, but uh, I think 2B, but in the, in the, in the Bible for, for, for finite groups, but it doesn't matter. For, so, for some order to element G, so G squared to 1 to an identity in the monster, is defined at A, B, C, D, and C is even, and, and then all of them has to be integers, and uh, this has to be also inside SO2Z. Okay, so it's a subgroup of the modular group that we usually work with. Are there some Gs that this group isn't in SO2Z? Yeah, that's the funny part. Yeah, that's the funny part. And people don't have a good understanding of it till some understanding it very recently. So for each G, you have to find this There's no, no, a priori not. But there's some, there's m m some hints, okay, from physics, from the orbifold construction. So let's pause for one second. Th why this is, you know, impressive? First, it, r it really points to um, it really points to the fact that the largest Borelli group has a reason to exist. <laughs> it has a natural representation in front of your eyes, under your nose, if you look into the world of modular forms. And that's also uh, connected with the fact that the modular forms involved are just not any of your, you know, obscure module forms. They're all very canonical objects. And once you put in extremely mild conditions, it's done. It's unique. So how to understand this? Well, it turns out that this orbifold theory has monster symmetry. This is uh, also proven by Franco Leposki Merman. And, uh, and, uh, the, the, and based upon uh, previous important works by Rob Grease. So, how do you understand it? We start with this target space. And we know that this guy already has big sporadic symmetries, but way smaller than the monster. This is called the Conway group that's acting. Well, Conway zero, they, he has too many groups. That's why we need to label them. Of course, he himself didn't call it Conway zero, but that's how we call it. Um, but you just need, the magic thing is that you just need one extra generator to go from, to, to, to go from Conway to the monster. Okay, and what this guy, what, what, what this generator does is that it's a, you know, non-geometric symmetry. It exchanges the twisted and the untwisted sector, so these two sectors. And 
that's the idea. Okay. So back to the question about how to predict what uh, gamma sub g is. Well, then this fact together with this fact namely that SO2Z transforms like this up to a phase so these two facts explains the part of gamma sub g, the relevant modular group uh, that lies inside SO2Z. Because this rule can only be applied yeah, um, for SO2Z elements. Otherwise, you're not preserving the torus even, so you don't know how to make such an argument. So for instance, in this lucky case, this explains the whole group. I mean, to turn it around, if you look at um, G, and then you look at the order of G, let's put this to be H to be identity in particular, then you see that if G to the power C is identity, then you get something that's closely related, right? So then you can predict what kind of uh, generators this gamma sub G must have in order to be compatible with the SO2Z transformation there. So that gives you strong hints what gamma sub G is. But from this argument, you cannot see the part of gamma sub G that lies outside SO2R, which is, however, very important to establish that you have this uniqueness condition. Okay, and um, I'll give you a little bit of an idea about how to prove this, how this was proven by Borchert. Right, so now imagine that you're handed with this conformal field theory and it's proven that it has monster symmetry and the partition function seems to work out fine and you want to prove that and on the other side for all 194 uh, different choices of G you have worked out the candidates for T sub G now you want to argue that these, this, this when you consider the twining so when you when you consider, you know, these characters, this H sub A, uh, H sub N, so the subspace of your Hilbert space, indeed does the job to reproduce the Q, the infinite Q series there. Okay, how do you prove such a thing? So, Borchers' proof basically involves. Uh, the, the basic idea is to use this identity plus other identities but, uh, plus other similar ones. So it, it's an infinite product on the left hand side. Mm. So positive. Okay. And the, and the power, the exponent, is given by the Fourier coefficients of the J function that's defined up there. And this is an infinite sum, right? And just like Q equals E to the 2 pi i tau, now we have two variables and it's also related like this. And this, of course, also involves the C's, right, in the Fourier expansion. So what you get is a recursive relation among, 
the coefficients. So that's on the side of the TG, of the mathematical uh, uh, conjecture. So what you can do is that take the FLM theory So you have a 2D conformal field theory. What you can do is to take the symmetric product theory of VFLM. In other words, you second quantize them. This N has nothing to do with that N, so let's use K. You second quantize the theory. And you can write down the partition function, the generating function for the partition function of this symmetric product theory given uh, such k. And it turns out that it's also given by such, you know, this kind of infinite product because if you look at it, it has the form of, you know, of um, a, free, uh, a bunch of uh, um, taking a trace over a fox space, basically. So then you also get recursive relations. So this can be generalized to uh, coefficients of Tg. Okay, so not just Cn, you can put a little g here for all g. And if they sh satisfy the same set of recursive relations, you can just check the first few terms. If the first few terms are the same and they satisfy the same recursive relation, you're done. That's how this is proven. So um, string theorists th thought, oh, okay, easy. So this construction is just, uh, you know, if just, uh, you know, instead of uh, considering uh, two-dimensional CFT, you consider just really the full string theory and p compute the partition function. So this is uh, made. This has been made uh, concrete last year. Uh, so the construction, physical cons uh, construction, to realize this mathematical construction, is to take heterotic strings and compatify on, you know, this on the on the on the non-supersymmetric side, on the FLM theory, and uh, left and then uh, some other uh, supersymmetric theory which is actually also um, a nice one on the right hand side well so this after proof I can also just call this V supernatural where you have proven that they're the same thing and on the right hand side there's something called V supernatural and such that uh, these uh, and uh, a circle, okay, and this realizes the setup that these guys are considering there. Moreover, this setup uh, also uh, gives some idea about what this gamma sub g is doing uh, in the space-time picture. So to extend this picture out of SO2z, yeah. So you compatify down to one plus zero dimension. Okay, so that's the story that's mostly understood for monstrous moonshine. And I have some time left for new moonshine. And you might put plural there. Okay. Yeah. It's a string theory partition function. It, you, you don't distinguish a single string or, you know, it's a partition function for the full string theory. No, no, it's a space time. You compute a space time quantity.
So to give you, now the goal for the, the rest of the lecture is to give you an idea about what's going on with the new moonshine, okay? And first, thing we, one has to uh, introduce is the so-called elliptic genus of what we have mentioned yesterday, the K3 surfaces. So for a superconformal field theory, let's call it T, script T, with 2 comma 2 superconformal symmetry, we define an elliptic genus of such a theory to be the following trace over the Lamo Lamo Hilbert space. So we know what L0 is. These are the zero modes of the Virasoro. And when you have n equals 2, there is also a U1 current. And J0 denotes the zero modes of the U1 current. And this factor plays the role of minus 1 to the F. So as a result, this is an index. If you put y equals 1, so you forget about um, the grading of, uh, of the, uh, the left-moving U1 charges, what you'll get is nothing but a Witten index. It just counts the number of Ramon-Ramon ground states. But if you keep, this, uh, keep track of this, then you get a more interesting information. So this is, elliptic genus is one of the quantities that you can actually compute without knowing all that much about the theory. And nevertheless, it's still a non-trivial quantity. It computes the states that are, uh, that are BPS in the sense that there are Ramon ground states on the right hand side where there's no uh, fugacity for the U1 currents, but on the left hand side it can be anything. And you can show that there are nice properties. Yeah, <laughs> I'm coming back to write this if yeah. this is what you're asking. Okay. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. And since it is a CFT quantity, a trace over the CFT over space, you can also give it a, a interpretation in terms of part integrals. Namely, you also get some sort of modularity going on. So now you have two variables. They transform like this. Under SO2Z. And this will leave the function basically invariant. And it also has the so-called spectral flow symmetry related to the symmetry of the superconformal um, algebra. That's one point of view to say this. So, which says mathematically that the function is also basically invariant 
if you shift the uh, fugacity by an integral amount of tau. This simply says that you should really think about this fugacity z as a point in the lattice on the torus. Okay, and I say that these are basically invariants, so there are some uh, phases you have to take into account, and the transformation is, uh, is uh, indicated actually uh, by the central charge C of the uh, CFT, T. And this structure gives them uh, the name that's called Jacobi form in the math literature. And fortunately, this is also a mathematical beast, some kind of modular objects that's very well under control, as we will see in a little bit. And the third property, yeah. Y bar? Yeah, exactly. You can put Y bar to, J, uh, to, to the J bar. And what will happen is that you're basically computing a, a more refined version of partition function, which is very hard for general CFTs. And once you put one of the Ys to be zero, you project it to the Ramon, Ramon ground state on one side. So that gives the third property. I'm writing, so you can't see because that it hasn't been written. <laughs> so that it's an index, or it's a it's a rigid quantity, or that means invariance under defi reasonable defamation defamation. of the theory. And I have to say that when writing these down, um, I'm assuming that uh, the theory has discrete spectrum. There's no continuum. Otherwise, you have to be a little bit careful with these. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it, for n equals 2, you have to put it as an uh, and the uh, actual condition that it has spectral flow symmetry. But you still have spectral flow symmetry of the algebra. Yes, but, uh, spectral. Yeah, the, you, you still have to require that the, the theory cooperates with it. True. So an example of such uh, a theory is nonlinear sigma model well basically it just says that you have a target space and your field is you know a map from a world sheet to the target space and you want to put a SUSY on it so there's fermions okay and then you want to say, like, a priori, these are not conformal, but you have 2 to SUSY when you have target space, uh, let's call the target space M again, and let's call it the sigma model of M. Okay. So when M is scalar, you have 2 to supersymmetry. When M is Calabiao, you have the theory is also conformal. You can check that because of Ricci flow, so the beta function vanishes. So you have the super conformal algebra as symmetry. And when you also have hypercalar structure, then you have a sphere value of uh, complex structures. So you have SU2. So the R symmetry, that translates to the R symmetry. So roughly speaking, you have this restriction on the target on one side, 
and the symmetries on the other side. So example, as I have announced, the example will be K3 surfaces, but uh, let's do color BL two folds in general. So there are only two types, right? One is boring, the other is less boring. So the C, the dimension, will be then for you, so you have super formal theory for these Calabial cases, and the C will be given by three times the dimension of the target. And for this case, you have C equals 6. So then you can look up, you want to know what the elliptic genus is, and you look up your favorite math resources and look for the Jacobi forms that transform according to central charge 6. And the book or the website you're looking at will tell you that the available, there's just one available function. So again, uniqueness kicks in. And this function is, well, you can write it down very explicitly. Why not? Squared. Okay, so this is an infinite product, but you can put everything on Mathematica. And two similar terms. You just change on some signs and so on. So this is the only available function that transforms like a so-called Jacobi form according to C equals 6. But you don't know the prefactor. So after exploiting uh, property 1 and 2, now let's exploit property number 3. It's index, it's rigid, so in the sigma model case, it's invariant under uh, changing uh, points in the moduli space of your calabial. Your calabial can be very skinny or very fat. The elliptic genus has to be the same. Yeah, except for, of course, that C is different. So moreover, it literally is a topological invariant of the manifold that generalizes, for instance, the Euler characteristic. And here, you only have one number to fix. So you only need one topological invariant. So this is 0, and this is t. And if you look closely at the definition of the elliptic genus, you can convince yourself that, you know, the elliptic genus in general reduces, will give you um, the Euler characteristic if you put z to be zero. In other words, it reduces to the well-known fact that the Witten index of the Sigma model on the Calabial is nothing but the Euler characteristic of the Calabial. Okay, so look, when you put y to 1, right, z equals 0 is y to 1, then you turn off the fugacity, and this term becomes 1, and these two terms as well. So c equals 8 for k3, and 0 for t4. And voila, you're done by just using these three um, properties.
So, I don't want to talk too much about zero. Because it's not as fun as non-zero. So, let's talk about the K3 case. Are there questions at this point? Yeah. Uh, why? Oh, they're proportional? Yeah, but zero is proportional to everything. But okay, they're closely... Re you can think about, okay, good. Yeah, I mean, the, the most manageable... Well, using the Jacobi property wasn't the way people initially computed the, the elliptic genus of K3. And it is true that people use K T4 to compute K3 elliptic genus because if you uh, take an orbifold, let's take a Z2 orbifold, but you can take Z3 and etc. orbifold of a specific T4, so uh, a specially pretty torus, and you get, and you blow up the singularities and you get a K3. Yeah, so you can compute it via the orbifold uh, CFD techniques. That's an honest, more honest computation if you want. Is there a more direct CFD way to see that the EG should vanish for T4? CFD way? Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, Some zero mode somewhere or something? Yeah, 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 you certainly can, yeah. But um, let me say one more thing. Like, for Calabria four folds, you can have different elliptic genus, but three folds, the elliptic genus are all the same up to a constant, but you wouldn't say that Calabria three folds are all the same. Uh, so this modularity can be sometimes too strong if you want. So what you can do with this non-zero guy is that we haven't used really the n equals 4 comma 4 superconformal algebra. So what you can do is decompose into, well, So this is, by W, H, and L, I mean, this is an irreducible representation of the n equals 4 superconformal algebra, the Cairo, only one copy. Okay. We know that it has to work because the theory has n equals 4, 4, so why not do it, right? It looks like, it sounds like, you know, I mean, when people initially did it, they have the more, they have more reasons to do it, but Right now, it sounds like a, 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 you know, a bachelor project if I cannot come up with anything better. But let's do that. And this has been computed uh, thanks to a lot of work in, uh, in the early 80s. So this has been computed, and so you can just like look at what's, so H and L denotes, you know, the, the weight, the conformal weight and the J0 eigenvalue of the highest weight state in the, in the representation, okay? So you know these functions, so you can just write down, it's a, it's a linear algebra problem to say like, how many copies of the, uh, of the representation contributes in the elliptic genus? Because you have the function, right? Uh, explicit function there, and you have the explicit function here. I'm just not writing down for you, so you can just ask Mathematica to spit out numbers. So that corresponds to each uh, H and L. And there is two types of uh, representation. So,
So this is some prefactors, again, some infinite product of th that sort. And this is some interesting infinite sum that looks like this, but we don't really need to know the definition. So these two terms correspond to uh, the so-called massless representation because they're annihilated by some actual uh, uh, supersymmetry generator. And these are the normal kind of representation. And moreover, this is an infinite sum. Okay, And Tn is the number of uh, the representation of weight m plus one half, and they always have spin one half. Okay, that appears in the elliptic genus. Uh, yeah, sorry. So in this way, you can basically uh, rewrite the function I wrote there into this form, which is their equivalent as a function. But you get out an interesting part that is an infinite Q series, basically uh, encoding the number of uh, massive representations that you have. The tilde? Uh, where is the tilde? Uh, I didn't understand the question, but it seems that it has been resolved. <laughs> it's the best. And so we really want to know how many represent massive representations there are, right? So let's just look at it. Let me pull out some factors. And it was observed in 2010 by Iguchi, Oguri, and Tachikawa that these few numbers, for instance, these three numbers on board, and I think there's a few more of them, five of them, are dimensions of irreducible representations of the sporadic group material 24, which is not as monstrous as the monster, but it's still huge. It has about 10 to the 9 um, elements. And it's a very, very nice group. OK, so the story of moonshine then starts again. Because we want to know why. We want to know what these representations are. We want to know the twining. We want to put a G here and put a G there. And so that's, um, that's what people have been doing. And first, let's talk about the property of H. It is not like J function, a nice uh, modular function that we are very familiar with. But in some sense, it's even better because it's one example of this kind of new object called mock module form that's very sexy recent year in the recent years in the math literature. So what's a mock module form? This is a mock module form. But what, what do I mean? I mean that this guy transforms like a module form. 
under SO2Z. And now it has a non-trivial weight, so it's not invariant on a rescaling of, uh, of uh, two-dimensional ladders. The weight is one half, if you want, if you care to know. And as you can see explicitly, there is this integral here, so it's no longer holomorphic. Okay, so if you have a holomorphic function such that you can add a piece. Well, you can change this. This is called the shadow function, but you cannot change the rest of the structure is fixed. Okay, so it breaks holomorphicity in a very controlled way. And then by adding this non-holomorphic piece, you can get a function that transforms like a modular form. Then it's called a mock modular form. So it has a beautiful story in mathematics involving our favorite uh, Ramanujan and so on. It's almost uh, too, too, too good to be, uh, to be true as a story. Well, almost like, I mean, I don't mean it in a way that with like sex violence and dead bodies, but <laughs> uh, yeah, it's almost, you know, as interesting as that. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, that's not the topic of the lecture. <laughs> <laughs> so, to summarize, in 2010, people realized that, whoa, there's this new moonshine involving this new type of uh, modular objects, and the immediate question is, of course, what's the physics? You know, what's the third corner in the diagram? In other words, how do we construct these infinite dimensional representation for now the Matu group? So to answer is, this question is a homework problem. So I'm going to <laughs> talk about something else. <laughs> so, um, and afterwards, it was realized, actually, that this case, this case of mock moonshine, is just one example what's of what's called the Umro moonshine. <coughs> Okay, so we have seen yesterday that apart from leech letters, there are also 23 nice lattices in 24 dimensions that's classified by Niemeyer, and they have nice non-trivial root systems, and so on. And you can define the automorphism group and get to some interesting finite groups that we call G, X, where X is its root system, and we will denote the lattice itself by NX. I should have make bigger boxes. And in a way that I won't be able to explain today, you can also uniquely specify certain interesting mock modular forms from the data of the lattice. And you call it um, the resulting mock module form H of X. So this is can be all constructed in a uniform way. And the surprising thing, well, not for you since I'm lecturing here, so I told you what the story is about, but a priori it's extremely surprising that the mock module forms you construct relates to the automorphism group of the Niemeyer lattice in exactly the same way that we have seen, in exactly the same moonshine way. For instance,
if you take the simplest case of the 23, in the sense that you just have a lot of A1s, and as we have said yesterday, the group is just M24, and the Mach module form you construct in this way recovers the Q series that we wrote there. But there are 20 tw 22 more such examples. And after you observe that, you can generalize this construction by looking at how the group acts on the lattice and write down a mock module form for all elements of G. <coughs> So I have about two minutes left. Yeah. Okay. So what is the status of constructing this representation? <coughs> what I can tell you is that the initial case hasn't been solved. The N24 case, that was already seven years ago that people started looking at it, <coughs> but we haven't found a way to construct the infinite dimensional representation. <coughs> um, by now, how many cases of these 23 have been solved? I don't know because I'm still writing the draft tonight. Um, <laughs> but there's already two papers, existing pa papers on that topic. <coughs> but in total, I think about 10 we have it on, on the control. Unfortunately, all for smaller groups and the constructions all seem a little bit you know, not generalizable. The story seems to be beautifully uniform, so we're looking for something uniform. So I can say about this construction, including mine, and maybe in particular mine, that <coughs> these are not satisfactory solutions. So how about the K3, right? We have the elliptic genus of K3, and we have the Haupt modules for the monster moonshine. So we know that V supernatural, the monsters, produces a lot of the Haupt module. There's another moonshine that's very similar to the monster. It's sort of a super symmetric version of it. It has Conway symmetry, which also uh, contributes a lot to the, the, the relevant objects are also hot module. And we see that we have seen that uh, the M24 moonshine <coughs> can produce elliptic genus of K3. And uh, my collaborators and myself have been proposing, have been advocating that all cases of Umro moonshine, there's a, there's a well-defined way to also get to elliptic genus of K3, okay? And uh, it was a realization in a few years ago that the Conway moonshine also can be related to elliptic genus of K3 by you know, adding supersymmetries, adding more supersymmetry. The original construction to get a help module is n equals one to get more. Uh, if, but if you turn uh, impose more supersymmetries, you get to that. So um, we know that uh, different uh, points in the moduli space of K3 sigma models have different symmetries. So the, the the obvious question of w how relevant this is for the moonshine problem is how do they compare with uh, the, 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 finite, the, the finite groups that we want, the, 
that arises from moonshine. So the comparison at the moment, well, this is a theorem, but this is the best we can do, is that we have Umbro moonshine, and we have this Conway moonshine. They have to be a little bit more in, in proportion, I guess, so you get the idea. And here, here, here is the possible twined elliptic genus of K3. Okay. So this picture, uh, first you have to classify the symmetry group of the, when you move along the moduli space of uh, sigma models of K3, each point will have a different symmetry group. And you have, first step is to classify what these are, okay? And the second step is to classify how these groups might act on the uh, elliptic genus, on the, on the BPS spectrum, and hence classify the possible twined elliptic gen genera that you might have. So once you do that, you compare to the data that you get from this arrow and this arrow. And this is what we, where we are right now. So the conclusion is that this is not quite enough, but it gets, gets you very close. In some cases, it's enough. But in general, it's not enough for all 23 cases. So we're looking for a better solution. And that's the homework problem. So I'll stop here. Yeah, there's um, some other aspects of the development I had zero time to talk about, which is, you know, the discovery of more cases, even more cases after this, but... Yeah. Well, not, it's, not, it's not geometric per se, right? You have an S1, but the internal CFD part is, is this FLM uh, theory on one side, and on the other side, it, you actually put the, con the this side. Well, you can also choose to put other CFT, SCFTs on it, but um, that's what they did. So they means um, Roberto Volpato and uh, Natalie Paquet and Daniel Person. Yeah, yeah, but I mean, for his erotic string is as good as everything, I think. Well, because you have left and right mover. Oh no! It's just um, it's just uh, uh, the the lattice points that have um, that have um, uh, length square two. So it's a small part of the lattice. Because I mean, you can see that this is not self-dual, right? In gen in general, in general, huh? 